It's a very exciting project about the very first peoples who inhabited the island of Ireland. It is a real privilege to be working with these very special objects found in the ground. Our connection to our ancestors, the first people who came to Ireland 8,000 BC. It's always about the objects because they're really our window, our opportunity to connect to people of another time. We have evidence, hard evidence, and the most of the evidence is their stone tools. And everything came from the natural world around them. I've lived in this valley for nearly 20 years. Actually excavating a site in this part of the world is something I never expected to do. And what we're trying to understand is when the first traces of humans coming into this landscape actually were. We're on the island, this is always dry. If you look where the longer grass is, that would have been where it was wet. So the people were here on this dry island. Coming into an area, we don't know exactly what we're going to find. Very surprisingly, we started to find flint artifacts. And these were sharp artifacts, meaning they've never been moved, it was really exciting for us. I think the reason that people are here, around about 8,000, possibly as recently as about 5,000 years ago, is that these are good places for fishing and waterfowling. The excavations here are one part of a bigger set of objectives in the Portalis project to look at the environment and the landscapes of the earliest inhabitants of uh, West Wales. Here in, in this valley, for the period we're talking about, the Neolithic and the Mesolithic, we haven't had much of that time period of archeology span before. If people were having fires on the top of these mounds, what we're going to see are periodic um, episodes of burning and charcoal that get into the pollen record. The site actually is very ephemeral. We've got very small scatters of flint material. We had a really exciting find from this trench, Trench 10. One of our volunteers was cleaning back in this trench. They found this piece, which is a microlith, and this is mesolithic. This is a diagnostically mesolithic piece. Some of the diagnostic tools that we find in the Mesolithic are microliths, tiny, tiny little projectile points that are often associated with hunting. They're flint pieces that you can insert into harpoons. Trench 4 produced some flint flakes and so did Trench 1, but Trench 1 also produced a polished stone axe. Polished stone axes are always associated with early Neolithic activity. So what we're looking at here is probably an event which incorporated a group of people who were using both those material objects. So both microliths and polished stone axes. 
what we know from the material is that there was prehistoric activity here probably looking at about 10,000 years ago, roughly. It's piecing together the puzzles around the excavation. It is a very small assemblage. It's just over 50 pieces of flint work, but it's an assemblage. It's people, people were there. Bidani named Emma Eu ERT, save electro-resistivity topography. I basically bid any need to head a current channel Troy Rdear at the end of the year. I'm going to go to the new wedding in Johanna Gurthes, Troy Gurdola Priv, and Troy Hena Achni Gwald bid in Johanna Vathel Priv or Danani. So, I'm going to bid any disco in the world, and I'm going to need a good ground truth thing, a good valkoring or Priv in the world. I'm going to Edrych yn fwy tybygol, um, rydyn ni'n weld wahanol mawn fy'n hyn na byd yn ni'n weld yn y cae drof yna. Ond uh, ma, ma'n dechrau adeiladu hyn o beth oedd y til yn, yn edrych fel. We drove down from London and had a look at the artefact. Um, as we know nothing about it when someone says flints or arrowheads to us we don't really know what to picture so we approach it from an outside eye and try and like learn about archaeology and how that can link to dance it looks like people may have been coming here for a number of years across this period when the uh, people were changing from hunter-gatherers to the very first farmers which is an interesting time period. We're very visual people, so seeing it and walking with Martin in it kind of guiding us in ways that we wouldn't necessarily go. Is it a lot different digging on the marsh versus other surrounding land here? The stone tools we got um, are probably the remains of um, arrowheads perhaps um, and other tools maybe for processing animals so um, I think that what they were doing here was probably hunting, um, fishing, wild fowling. This is a great place to live. There's so many resources in a wetland environment. Being on the spot of where it happened is really changing our approach to it and having all those surroundings um, sensation like the, the noise of the nature, the, the, smell, the smell, the wind, and then how the, the, the floor is and the sensation of it on our feet and body. We actually go on our own path to figure out the experiences they've gone through and see how that affects us as dancers. The project that I'm involved in is developing a pilgrimage route which is between Wexford in South East Ireland and St David's which is in Pembrokeshire in Wales. And at the core of it is this 150 kilometre pilgrimage route connected by the sea journey from Rosslare to Fishguard. We're doing different types of terrain and different types of walking, but it's all this lovely connection from one to the next. So welcome, welcome pilgrims, welcome everybody to, um, uh, to this beautiful monument, uh, which marks the start of our Aeron River pilgrimage. We start with a uh, talisman, 
And here we have um, a number of, these are white quartz, and I'd like you to just choose one. When you do a pilgrimage, it's a, it's a contemplative walk. Are you ready? Yes. yes. <laughs> Fabulous. Let's go. It's heading this direction to Aberdeidon. Okay, there we go. The pilgrimage route between Wexford and Pembrokeshire is not just one way. It's definitely from Ireland to Wales and Wales to Ireland. It's using story and the stories particularly around two particular Celtic, 5th century Celtic saints, St Aidan and St David. Walking the land, that's always where I find myself most at home spiritually. I, I think it's really interesting following a river because the river starts off tiny and, and it ends up, you know, gushing into, a, into the Cardigan Bay. So sort of very symbolic, you know, yeah, to pilgrimage. It's 26 miles from uh, source to sea, so we're just still a few miles outside of Aberdeiron. Sort of, I think it would be a good place to stop and just have a little, little contemplation. I've got a little quote by a chap called John Muir. When you tug at a single thing in nature, you find it is attached to the rest of the world. Mm. Yeah. Head off that way and then go down to the, uh, to the bridge. That's it, after you. So, happy pilgrims. We made it. Yay! Yay! <laughs> a great walk down anyway. And uh, so here we are, and there's been the Aeron River has now come into the harbour here. That is Cardigan Bay. Further is the Irish Sea, and then there's Ireland. As this journey draws to an end, we give thanks for the gifts it brought and how they became inlaid within, where neither tide nor time can touch them. One, two, three. I'm the Living Seas Manager for the Wildlife Trust of South and West Wales and I'm based at the Cardigan Bay Marine Wildlife Centre in Newquay and a lot of that involves doing research on the marine mammals, what we call the Cardigan Bay Big Three which is the bottlenose dolphins, harbour porpoises and Atlantic grey seals. Dolphins up ahead! So when we encounter bottlenose dolphins, there's various bits of information that we're trying to get, gather. And I'm trying to capture the dolphin dorsal fin. We are also trying to capture various acoustic information. And my research focuses on the acoustic behavior of the dolphins here. We use an underwater microphone to record the dolphins. What I'm most interested in are bottlenose dolphin signature whistles. And signature whistles are a bit like humans have names. It's a unique whistle to an individual that they use to broadcast their identity. Yep, whistles. And echolocation. And another type of very important uh, vocalization for their biology is um, echolocation. Um, and so that's a form of biological sonar that the dolphins use to hunt and find and track their prey. So there's been a few buzzes. They're foraging. Of course, we have a lot of wider concerns about climate change, potential impacts of vessel traffic on the dolphin populations here. These populations of animals, you know, that they're, they're here, we're very lucky that they're here, but it doesn't always mean that they are going to be here. There's a lot of pressures on the marine environment now. We're lucky enough to be able to come into the marine environment. We're able to explore it, but we also need to respect it. 
the pressures on the wildlife are increasing. When I first came here, well, what we used to see is big groups of animals all coming together, quite often foraging, rather than more social behaviour. It's sad to see that they're having to spend so much time foraging. You get that feeling that they, they're not so relaxed. It's not really our world. Humans don't belong in, in the marine environment. We want to find out as much as we can about the environment here, the animals that call it home, so that we can help to protect them for the future. This is Hook Lighthouse, Hook Head Peninsula, oldest operational lighthouse in the world. It was built by Richard Marshall. He was Strongbow's uh, son-in-law, and uh, he was a great knight, well respected. So he needed protection to show his ships the way. It was the beacon of life. Without seeing that beacon, it was nearly certain shipwreck. You could see that beacon on a clear day from Wales. It wasn't very dangerous because of all the rocks. Oh, it was lethal. Have a look at that. The story about a patch in time going back millions of years ago, dead, extinct creatures, fossilized. They look like nuts and bolts. Like a lattice of some sort of creature going back millions of years ago. It's very fish-like. Coast Watch is very important for kids. It gets them out on the beach with purpose and makes them aware of the whole environment along the coast. Anyone knows what these are? They're edible periwinkles. People collect them and sell them, but they're a little snail. If you turn them up that way, he has a groove. A signal groove is called, and it injects it into the barnacle and sucks it out. Oh, oh, yeah. We are going to do a coast watch survey today. We'll give you buckets, you work in pairs, really running and collecting as many different types as you can. Okay? Let's go. Climb where there's no honeycomb, okay? So climb, but don't walk onto honeycomb. So I want you to now just look for some honeycomb and feel it, and then look if you see any animals maybe in it as well. So here's a really nice bit of fresh honeycomb. Look at all these worms. There are millions of little worms. You can yeah. feel it somehow sharp there. Well, they bite me. I don't think they bite. You put your hand over it. Well, Coast Watch is important as a citizen science project. What we're trying to do is get informed citizens who know how to participate. There's one under here, huge. Oh, that's a huge. You saw a little bit of the honeycomb was wrecked by one of them. Another one did some damage to limpets. The others swarmed around them and told them not to. For me, that was a success. There's been people camping here over the summer, so we're going to have a lot of paper, burnt plastics, stuff like that. 
Oh, I've got a plastic strap, rope, sweet wrapper, plastic packet, a hose pipe, and a plastic strap. I found a rope, a, a vapor, plastic packet, and a binding tape. Single use binding tape. It is good because we are cleaning the beach. They're tomorrow's politicians, or tomorrow's marine scientists. They'll ultimately dictate the direction all this is going to go. A stunningly beautiful area, but over the last few days, the temperature on some of the rocks has gone near to 40 degrees centigrade and limpets are just falling off the rocks, dead. You're very welcome aboard the boat. Thank you very it's much. Friday, Sunday. So climate change and heat waves is something which would probably concern me most in the intertidal area and we have a huge responsibility. In there is Ratmullen Cove, that's where we launch, right. our, launch our kayaks. Yeah. We kayak over here where there's lobster pots. We haul our pots over here. Two years ago was brilliant here, there was loads of lobsters. But last year was all right, this year's not great. 10,000 years ago, Mesolithic people would have been obviously on different boats and they would have been further in because sea level was much lower. The shelter of the Waterford estuary would have attracted them. You would have been looking for fresh water. You would have been looking for food. And the salmon, which come down the west coast, around Ireland, and then go up the Waterford estuary in huge numbers. Well oh, right done. First go. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Oh, yes! I don't believe it. I think there's even two baby lobster. Two baby lobsters. Yes, look at that. My goodness. My goodness. Right. Wow. Right, we've got a small little baby lobster here. We'll just measure them first. Now, you measure, see, see the eye socket here? You see this line here on the back of the shell? 87 millimeters, nah, he's way too small. That line should be back here, so he's way, way too small anyways. But he is a, um, he's a male, these, see these two? If they're hard, that's male. If they're real soft, it's female. And females have more flared tails and they might have loads of loads of black little eggs under it. They're like little marbles, millions of them. The message for us is that climate change is definitely happening now. We're getting very unusual weather and everybody can do something to help animals adapt. We have to reduce the amount of pollutants, including bleach, going into the sea. We have to reduce the amount of interference when animals are really heat stressed. We need to care for sea life a lot now. I've been involved in, I suppose, maritime activity in Waterford since the early 80s. Just finished an eight-year term as a, a port director. The port is hugely important. I mean, traditionally, when you have a busy port, everything else around the region is, is, is also busy. Busy port, busy hinterland. The port is synonymous with the city of Waterford for many, many years. And sometimes when a port moves out of the inner city, like we moved to Bellevue in 1993, there's a little bit of disconnect then happens because people don't see a lot of things going on. We set up a heritage committee on the board, made up of board members. So we decided to, to pick on two or three particular projects that we felt would make a big difference to the communities in those particular areas.
I'm chairman of the Cheap Pine Boat Owners Association. We're here in Cheap Pine Quay, adjacent to the River Shore. Behind me, you can see all the boats are aground. We have no water and we have to wait for the water to come in. It's one of the problems that you face in a, in a harbour that's, that's tidal dependent. Uh, we need the water, obviously, to float the boats. A group of us talking about what a benefit it would be to the boating community if we could some way access the boats uh, and keep them afloat 24 7. We got the community together, they have to be on board. Cheek Pine is a very, very, very famous village. A lot of pilots, river pilots, and everything came from these areas. There was a lot of traditional fishing from these areas. People fish for eels, fish for salmon. So we just decided that, you know, as a project to help the local community and help the people there to give them more access to the river. Because at the end of the day, it, it seems an awful shame that we have this beautiful river flowing down here. And, you know, at certain times, people might, might find it difficult to get access to it. Funding was from two sources, basically. Leader was the funding body that came behind us. That was crucial. You can't succeed without having it. Port of Water for were on board from day one, but it was a case of go do the work, lads. Well, the solution is outside of the main key. We have water all the time. 24-7, there's water, there's water there. All we needed to do was to be able to access this water. And the solution turned out to be a floating pontoon. All in all, it's a game changer here for the boat users. It's a natural progression for the port to get involved in these things. It brings the port and brings the, the maritime activity within the port closer to the people. From a port perspective, whatever we can do to enhance the enjoyment of this whole area for people, you know, we would like to do, you know, from a cultural and heritage point of view. I'm over the moon about it. It's an amazing achievement for the community and for the people who put the hard work in. It's a game changer. It's the first floating 24-7 facility on the River Shore between Dunmore East, Waterford and New Ross. Beautiful as it ever was. And now we're going to get to tie it all together with our environmental research program. I'm an American archaeologist, and I began working in Ireland in the late 70s. And in 1982, officially began what we call the Valley Lock Project. So the assumption when we came here was that, in fact, people hadn't come down to here um, to the southeast until about the Bronze Age, which would have been about 3,000 years ago. What we used to do is ride all the roads. So we would locate plowed fields and we would walk on the fields and look for stone tools. And we began finding hundreds of them. Tools that go back to the origins or the beginnings of Irish settlement, which was about 10,000 years ago. So we actually extended the uh, history of the area another six or 7,000 years. So we knew we were on to something. So right now I'm sitting at the foot of Nakavilish Head and our research area extends from here down Fornot Strand to Creighton Head. The last excavation we had, we had a crew of 45, worked a lot with the Waterford community, especially Don Maurice. And what we found was the people were just so proud of their heritage. This area of, of Ireland was really sort of ignored historically. My wife and I came back in 2016 we met a man named Noel McDonough, who was an amateur archaeologist. Noel McDonough was a fisherman. He loved to come here and watch the tides. And he became fascinated with how much was being revealed with these big storms that are being driven by our rapid climate change. He took us to see his artifacts. It's an entire shed with things bagged, labeled. It was incredible. We were doing this systematic survey, so where we would have students, you know, walking five meters apart across fields. So when Noel was collecting, he would walk until he found something, and then in his own Celtic way, he would spiral out like this, like the rocks, you know, like the decorations on the Neolithic tombs. And he would stop, he wouldn't stop collecting until his spiral, until he stopped finding artifacts. 
He did it for the love of it and the passion and because and it was so personally important to him. In 2016, we decided to uh, collaborate with him and try to meld the two areas. We found tens of thousands of artifacts. Noel, in his research, also found probably as many. It told us they were hunter-gatherers and fishers, so they lived off the natural resources. When you swim at half a mile and then turn around, it's a completely different perspective. And clearly the people in the past, they had both of these perspectives. They were always out there on the sea, whether it's for fishing or for travel. And they had this perspective looking out from the land. My primary perspective has always been a landscape perspective. So what I really wanted to do is find a place where I can relate the objects from the collection back to where they came from in the landscape and therefore understand the relationship. What is it about the places and how do the objects relate? What stories can we tell people seven, eight thousand years ago, maybe sitting around a campfire, have been making objects, having conversations, planning the next day. So now the plan is really to try and integrate these two collections and the places where they came from. The Ballylock project, what they did, is they recorded it by field. So therefore, it's much more precise. So I could actually go stand in a field, which is an acre, half an acre, and I know pretty well the nature of the location. This is a, a band flag, a buttram flag, the Lake Mesolithic object, which came from one of the fields that Noel MacDonough walked. And the uh, writing on this one, as well as every other object of the five and a half thousand that Noel picked up, the writing tells us that it's from Fornoch. It tells us which number of the fields. So it's number field number four. This is the first time that I've seen the material from the MacDonough collection with Thomas. With the Southeast Island collections, they are quite dense and condensed. On the Welsh side, we are much more dispersed and spread out. It has been a kind of creative process, really. Thomas and I are sitting here today looking at the um, McDonough collection. I'll go back to Ceredigia and I'll go and have a look at some of our collections. I think from what Thomas and I have looked at this morning, we're seeing a lot of Neolithic. The Mesolithic is always harder to find. It's more remote and, and less visible. And there was a perception until quite recently that Ireland was actually quite isolated in earlier prehistory, that there was very little links with anywhere outside of Ireland, that people arrived in the early Mesolithic and then sort of stayed put, but cut off contact. That perception has been challenged. I think what's really interesting is these two regions, the southeast corner of Ireland and, and western Wales, they are obviously connected by, by the Irish Sea, right? Um, and nobody has ever looked at those connections in, in any level of detail, because we know that people did travel across the Irish Sea, they did cross um, at, at various stages, and the technology was available to, to make those crossings. Our job is to link the distribution of the artifacts and the evidence of human settlement and occupation to a landscape that is significantly different than the one that they encountered. As most people know, sea level is rising, and the rate of sea level rise is linked to certain types of changes in the landscape. So that when the people were here, or arrived here 10,000 years ago, they were looking at a sea level that was lower. When that sea level started to rise, the little environments that are part of the estuary changed. And over the course of time, as sea level encroaches and advances, people move with respect to that. So our job is to look at the sediments underneath the present ground and underneath the estuary to see where land was. The coring is taking place in close proximity to known archaeological sites. If there is a potential for uncovering archaeological sites, any of those works would have to be carried out under license from the National Monument Service. Because of that, Joe uh, took Mizzen Archaeology on. The hole has opened. 
The hole's open all day and you're measuring it all the way down. Just be pushing it away. We ensure that any of the coring don't impact on the Bronze Age Folloctvia. We're really excited. It's an outstanding opportunity to put together several sets of data that will give us a tremendous insight into how people lived and in what settings they lived. We're getting nice deep sediments and the sediments that we're bringing up are a dark gray color, which means there's a lot of organic material in them, so we can date them, which is what's going to be the most important data. We found it. We found it. Yeah. One meter down. Oh my God. This is what was found. We cored in the area that was just off the heart of the Falochtvia, expecting to find what had been previously identified as a buried forest would give us a co complete connection between the Falochtvia, the buried forest, and the edge of the cove that we identified through these sediments. So this, in a sense, could be called a missing link between those two pieces of information. And this is what really we were really looking for. You don't always find it. In this case, we kind of did. We know that it's part of a more extensive landscape that was forested at one time and is probably, in all likelihood, associated with the archaeology. This is just the beginning, but we're working on putting together the pieces of the puzzle. I think the most important thing that we found is we found sort of all the hints of this landscape being here. And we're only halfway through. We still now have, we need to link up what we found today with the... Right. Because I've lived here all my life and grew up on the cliffs, I've always been collecting rubbish from the cliffs with my children. We have a passion for that. The driftwood was building up and then I just decided I really should do something with it. So I'd end up burning it. I just thought it was an awful shame to waste something so beautiful. So I eventually started gifting people some products. When I'm salvaging the wood on the cliffs, I, I notice um, some landslides. You can see the erosion, that's huge. Every winter, I see a change. Storms, bigger waves, bigger storms. Storm Ellen, it was early morning. Sunrise is coming over from the east, and you have the high tide, which is massive, because with the easterly winds, that's what gives the dramatic effect in the waves. It's not good in general, is it? You know, and more damage caused. I thought I'd introduce you to some forest bathing Shinrin Yoku, which is an experience that we have developed here in the woodlands. So Shinrin Yoku was created by a professor in Japan who was asked by the government to help the population who were living in, in the urban jungle. You're going to be introduced to using your five senses to connect with nature. Your noses to smell, your eyes to see what you can see. You're really tasting the forest. And it's had such a positive effect on people's health, regulating blood pressure, helping with depression. Oh, fantastic. 
How straight is that? I think that's 1897. Yeah. 1897. 1897. Yeah. Goodness me. Beautiful. Almost as old as me. <laughs> <laughs> the way it's presented is is amazing. It just allows you to think about how you experience what we walk through every day. But you get lost in it. You suddenly find that you've you've wandered off the planet almost it's you know you're somewhere else it is magical everything yeah. else has dropped away in a ditton on ord creer cragach de cried sleuth in sun loch shot a gwing ilon de loch in a new sheen kerna eisk frankik ishka kodlachacha on Shin, a Helimer are now a she. Lon le Quera, Agus le Shilini, Darga Gwita. Shalat a Fosh to Dena, Hone Hishki, Agus on Fionts. Le Shiog, Love le Love. Maris Mugol a Tossa Down. Marahiko, Gobroch.